Um, welcome to the documentary podcast budget webinar uh, with myself, Angel Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Peterborough Independent Podcasting Association for hosting me. And uh, if anybody would like to contact me um, uh, in any questions about the webinar today, uh, fractalbutterflyprod at icloud.com uh, is my email. Um, yeah, and you can check out um, my website anytime you want at fractalbutterfly.org. So let's just get started. Um, my uh, first slide says, in film production, I'd make the corners of the triangle and the triangle is a pretty much like, I'll go to the next thing so you can see the triangle. The story concept, good, a schedule, fast, and the um, uh, others prior. I'm just gonna get my chat room, chat window out of the way, one sec. There we go. I'll just read the thing. Okay, in film production, I'd make the corners of that triangle, the story itself. The schedule and the budget changes to one of the three corners of that triangle will always affect the other two. Thus, before you can think about your budget or your schedule, you must think about your concept. Are you making a long twiddle, verite film over many years, an urge investigation, an archival essay, a docufiction hybrid, and in this case, a podcast documentary? As your concept crystallizes, sketching out your schedule, how long will you research and shoot and edit and record audio? Are there any special constraints such as tight shooting window or audio recording window or an immovable delivery deadline? No budget can exist without, one sec, my chat room is like, my chat window is like in the way of my slides. Just wait. Um, as your concept crystallizes, sketching out a schedule, how long will you research, shoot and edit? Are there any special constraints such as a tight shooting window or an immovable dead delivery deadline? No budget can exist um, and every inevitable schedule change will affect the budget. As a final preparatory step, listing the, the key assumptions to define the budget, how long will the, fil the film be, or like in this case, the documentary audio, um, uh, how long will you be uh, shooting and recording and delivering on, where will you shoot, where will you um, get your archival material that you'll use, uh, most budgets have the assumptions at the top of the budget and more complex films. And I, I, I often, um, this is uh, based on, this whole presentation is based on a film, documentary film, but it's easily transferable to documentary podcasts. Um, more complex films might even have a page or two of assumptions um, at the budget, and this serves as a warning. If these assumptions change, the schedule and budget will too. It's worth noting that many projects start out with the assumption about the budget itself. And if you know the uh, nights in the project weekend project and plan to self-finance, um, you know, of hard cost, then you're working with that fixed budget and you're aiming for say like a million dollar budget studio partners. That's the kind of thing that's like more filmmaking. In this case with podcasting budget, you can start off with $20. Like I have like a headset that's like a Logitech, um, uh, you know, recording uh, device that I got from like London Drugs and you, you can, then you can also have like the budget go really high, it's like $2 million. Um, but anyways, keep going. So basically when you're making a budget for a documentary podcast, you're thinking about how your, good, your story and your concept, that will improve and that will be good if you go really slow. And if you have like your um, schedule go really fast, then you might compromise on some of your story, but you might also gain in some of your um, uh, your budget. So it kind of is like this back and forth. Um, one area is affected by the other area, um, and uh, yeah. So setting the finish line before you you start budgeting, you need to establish the finish line and how much of the uh, film. Uh, one sec. It's kind of annoying me that my chat room is not going away and I can't see it. There, I can see the window now. Um, so before you start budgeting, you need to establish the finish line and how much of the life of the film to include the production budget. If you have been commissioned to make a film or a studio and client, the finish line will be clearly established in the contract. But if you are producing independently, you will likely want to include all of the costs required to premiere the film or in this case, the podcast, documentary podcast, um, at say a major um, film festival and promote it and hopefully deliver it to prospective buyers. But even hey, that may, oh yeah. Angel, could you make the, um, could you present the slideshow again? It's just showing yeah, us. Yeah, for sure. Um, for some reason I was trying to, 
there's my, there it is. I got it. <laughs> I couldn't find the mouse. Um, and so now I'm just got that finally. So now I can go back to the thing. There, there we is. go. There we go. Now my mouse is found. Thank you. And now I'm fine. <laughs> okay. Can you see everything? Uh, yes, it looks great. Okay, great. Okay. So if, anyways, the, anyways, um, when may not be enough? What if those prospective buyers don't buy it, or if there's a hybrid distribution based on a deep connection you have developed with audience, turns out to be a better choice for your, your film, in this case, a documentary podcast anyway, without a web, with a website and publicity, social media, or impact campaign. Some funders uh, don't allow these items on the production budget, so the media need to be budgeted separately. Either way, you need to keep the whole life of the film, or in this case, the documentary podcast in mind as you budget, budget and you fundraise. So fundraising, um, uh, basically a good budget will reflect and serve the fundraising process. In the case of you know, commissioned films, but also commissioned podcasts um, and independent in the independent world, the full budget might be guaranteed up front. But may, mostly you have to do the fundraising and it includes grants and crowdfunding. This makes the budgeting process and everything else easier. But for most independent filmmakers, and in this case, you know, podcasters and documentary podcasters, the funds come in phase by phase, if they come at all. Um, a little bit of the development funding supports the creation of the fundraising trailer and the trailer unlocks production funding. And in case with documentary and podcasting, um, usually like using the, the home studio, using like, you know, in my case, like Trent Radio, and then with Peterborough Independent Podcasting, recording from home studio. Um, but the, this unlocks the early rough cut and that garners the post production funding. And then the process is risky, there's stops and starts, and almost inevitably, a filmmaker and like podcaster ends up self funding various parts of the process, underpaying or just not paying him and herself, which happens time and time again. So, hence the challenging career sustainability questions facing our field. How does one budget in the face of such uncertainty? Uh, first, you'll probably want to break your budget into phases. Then you may need high and medium and low scenarios to account for the uncertainty of fundraising. The high scenario should include uh, full professional rates and will be the budget that you'll submit to potential funders. The mid and the low scenarios for a budget should be kept to yourself. The mid scenario will involve compromises and the low version will be the absolute minimum guaranteed that you would need to complete the project acceptably. Although it might include calling in favors and making also some sacrifices. Um, so drafting the full professional budget first and then as needed add columns and break it into phases with the high and the low and the medium uh, scenarios. This enables to constantly adjust for available funds while also still pushing for fundraising. And basically this article is creating this full professional budget. And once you've created that, then you can make the mid and the low scenarios and then delete appropriate items. So this is what um, a budget looks like, the template. And oftentimes I've been able to use this budget when I'm making a documentary podcast in regards to um, the telefilm. This is a telefilm, uh, you know, Canada Media Fund uh, budget that's available for free online from their website. And so you can see that there's expenses and there's a low mid scenarios and a yearly and low scenarios. And these are some of the numbers that they've crunched. And so one of the major books that I use um, that is really incredibly important uh, for drafting budgets is what's called the film and budget um, video budgets by Maureen A. Ryan. And it's transferable to podcasting documentary budgets as well. And basically you have to consider um, your project development on your first line. Uh, in your expenses and producing staff, uh, you know, usually you, you have your home office, your home studio, so you have like your, your pay yourself um, to do a lot of the office work and, and coordinating admin work. And then you have to consider on the third line, the rights and the music and the talent, say you have a narrator, say you have um, actors, uh, reenactments and drama and fiction as part of your, your documentary, um, as well as maybe the people that you're interviewing. And then you have uh, potentially staff, you know, a lot of people um, don't end up having stuff, but maybe they do. They have an intern, they have a, an assistant. Um, and then there's production expenses, which can of course include the um, audio equipment. And in my case, oftentimes it's the film equipment, uh, the camera. 
Um, and then there's the, the, the next line, which is travel. Um, so just like whatever, you know, way that you're traveling to and from uh, the site where you're doing the audio recording for your documentary podcast. And then the post-production, which is your line for your stu home studio and your home office where you're doing your, your audio editing for your documentary podcast. And then insurance is really important. I stress to everybody to have that as part of their business. I have a, a basic, um, uh, you know, insurance um, so that their liabilities um, and all of that can just not have to be worried about. Um, so that's available for independent um, documentary podcasters and producers. And then um, there's office and admin uh, on the, the budget of expenses, as well as the next line will include, and this is mostly what people forget, but it's extremely important when you're making a documentary podcast that you remember to prioritize in your budget, uh, the publicity and the promotion, as well as your website and your festivals and social impact uh, campaign strategies and plans, as well as your digital distribution, um, whether it be on iTunes or through PIP, um, having that is part of your budget is incredibly important to, to make sure that that's on your, your line, on your, your uh, Excel spreadsheet, whatever you're using for your template. And then basically like you do the subtotal and there's a contingency, which is extremely important. A lot of people forget that, but that's 10% of your total of your budget. And this is a living document. This is a working living document that's continually changing and updating daily and weekly as you're inputting the numbers of the changing factors and variables when you're in the, the process of um, pre-production um, of creating these conditions that where you go into production, start recording that things start to change and you have to make the adjustments uh, to your budget. And then you have, in a lot of cases, with say you're working for a nonprofit organization, you might have a fiscal sponsor fee. Uh, and that usually applies to when I was working with um, Media Arts Peterborough, for example, with like the uh, Artspace Media Lab, they were our fiscal sponsor fee. So they would help us to get more grants um, and that kind of thing. Anyways, and then you have your grant total. So when it comes to low and mid scenarios uh, with a low budget, you, you can actually uh, make that so that you have like as bare minimum bare bones, like of what you would absolutely, you know, bare essentials, you know, really, really, really just need just to make it happen. So that might just mean like you and your um, headphones and your laptop in like, say, like your room. And you just put in like bare things. You don't put in travel. You don't put in staff. You don't put in, you know, like maybe even you get like use open source um, uh, music and you use, uh, say, uh, the different kinds of uh, open source software um, and very bare minimum, say you're just your phone for um, recording. That would be the low, the low budget if possible. And then say a medium budget would require going to say like Mars and like music and being able to get higher value production value um, uh, recording equipment for your documentary podcast and that would you know probably include um, a little bit more say on your uh, website um, and uh, maybe you don't you get you hire somebody rather than just do it yourself and so yeah and then they have it um, uh, in this template for you know telephone mostly for independent film but definitely is transferable to documentary podcasting producing um, and this is just the projections of how might your production company um, uh, work in their budget on a, a yearly basis so they have the, 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 the scenarios for that as well so the budget levels the, the sample budget say um, according to like this particular article um, there's a, a million dollar you know documentary and that that's like you know very commonplace within say Toronto and say within the, the, the documentary world um, for a lot of like feature films. Um, but when it comes to podcasting, you know, it could potentially be that price if you have like, say, like a celebrity, um, like an A celebrity narrator, and you have to get all of the music rights and you have to get all of the, the archival rights to say all of the journalism and all of the, the, the audio clips and effects that you're using. Um, anyways, and so presenting a very high budget to show very full professional rights, like union um, rates, uh, the CARFAC rates, which is the Canadian um, professional media arts um, rates, and the internet, the the IMF, uh, or not the IMF, the IMAA, which is the um, the Media Arts Association rates, which is where you find the schedule of um, per hour. Like they have like a, a whole. Uh, template that you can refer to often when you're writing grants or writing budgets, which is what I use as a standard um, for paying people what they're worth um, on a bare minimum, but they have um, 
for sure professional rates for high production value budgets, which I, I fully um, uh, recommend if you're going to be going into commercial um, uh, production. Um, anyways, and so basically helping to remind the funders and investors and other, you know, um, the people who are involved, your cast and crew, with how much everything really costs, which is crucial for these conversations around sustainability uh, for all of the people that are involved working on your, your podcast. So while there are many um, documentaries that are produced um, at that level and also higher, I deeply respect the, the fact that documentary um, budgets start at zero and some projects will only raise, um, you know, maybe uh, 10,000 to 20K for like a feature documentary podcast series um, to cover basic, you know, hard costs and others that are only ever partially funded. And they involve huge contributions of volunteer labor and services. And a cluster of funded documentaries um, ended up in say the 350 to 450 range. And although this range often relies on small number of shooting days and then a producer, director, writer, cinematographer, and right editor. And I'm often thinking of, of documentary filmmaking but it's easily transferable to of course documentary um, podcasts so wedding, wearing many many hats and various unfunded phases of the process and there's another cluster that's even higher in the range anyways and they, basically there's no right answer to what a documentary should cost and though undoubtedly no matter the budget there's never enough time or money is needed and compromises must be made so basically, um, the budgeting process to create the budget, you'll need your assumptions. And that just refers to your phone calls, your estimates, your guesstimates with talking to um, the, the people, like say where you're gonna do your location, where you're gonna, who you're gonna work with, um, where you're going to, uh, what you're gonna need and how it's gonna cost. And so that you put that on a separate, separate piece of paper of assumptions of um, how you're um, potentially going to be spending like in your expenses. Um, and then your schedule. Um, so basically you'll put like, say you have your pre-production schedule, which will be like, you know, one week um, you'll be researching and next second week you'll be coordinating and calling people and doing admin work. And then you have the next schedule in, um, of a week of um, recording and, and you're producing and production. And then you have another, like say a couple of weeks of like the, the editing process. And then a couple of weeks of doing publicity and, and distribution and marketing. And you can never forget that because important if you're going to make a, a documentary podcast you want to have people hear it so you have to put that in your schedule and you have to put that into your budget and you have to research it so lots of time for that research for your budget in the pre-production stage and you'll need to call your potential crew and different um, people in responsible for the archives and researching archives uh, plus you know any post facilities for your sound um, uh, recording sound design um, and basically start negotiating those rates as a producer, as a documentary producer. So you can use the template, the telephone template, um, as a very general guide and basically don't rely on it too much. Every project and location and team is unique and it's a living document and it's constantly changing and your research will be crucial to the successful of your budget. So in general, um, you estimate everything slightly high and then you use your full professional rates. Then once you see that there's an overall line item that you can reduce, you make these compromises and sacrifices to help bring that budget down towards its target. And so basically using like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets um, for these budgets, pr producers will use in the filmmaking world, independent you know, documentary filmmaking world, uh, things like movie magic. Um, and that's like a, a place where you can do it all. You have your schedule there, you have your budget there, um, you have you pay a fee for this you know, um, software, and then you're able to have all of those changing factors and variables similar to your Excel spreadsheet um, uh, reflect what your needs are on a daily basis as you're changing changing um, based on what you're doing and how you're going along with your recordings and your and your process. So basically it's a flexibility of that spreadsheet where you can add the columns for different phases and your high and your mid and your low scenarios that are always changing. So basically, um, you have to think about the software considerations, whether you're using open source versus proprietary software. Um, say you're using Audacity, which is open source, and GarageBand, which comes with your MacBook Pro. But maybe you want to use Adobe Creative Suite because that's you know an amazing tool with Adobe Edition uh, for your podcasting, producing your documentary. 
and of course, open source Reaper, um, which is really accessible and cheap and easy. And then you're thinking of your hardware considerations, your type of mic and your type of headphones, your laptop or your Mac or PC. So anyway, so we're going to move along. And the budget top sheet um, basically is your sheet that goes in the Telefoam uh, template. There's three tabs. There's one for your assumptions. There's one for your summary. And there's one for your uh, budget top sheet. And then there's the like Excel, like number crunching. And so basically, we'll start with exploring the actual budget. So basically, um, the top sheet offers the one page summary and includes the assumptions and the income and the expenses. And there are two main approaches to budget organization. Some keep all of the staff together in one section, um, and that's basically like above the line, while others account for staff members within each department. And so basically in the independent documentary producing world, there can be like a camera crew listed under the camera department. Um, but in documentary producing, it's, you know, with the, the audio equipment. And I tend to keep um, the staff together and generally preferred, you know, with the, the non-film funders and when frying for the film funders as well. This is geared towards a lot of filmmaking, but that's okay. So anyways, the detail budget, um, basically what that's about is that you look at the budget setup, every line item has an account number to the left. And basically in this book, like you can download um, a specific, uh, it comes with the, the book actually in, in downloadable budgets and templates, I highly recommend doing that. And the numbering system known as a chart of accounts, um, basically we saw on that, the slide that I showed you earlier with the, the 700, 800, like those numbers on the left-hand side, that's what that is. And it's used in an accounting system so the actual expenses can be compared to the budget at any time. And it doesn't really matter uh, which chart of accounts you use as long as you're consistent. And the studios and networks like in the documentary world, they require that you use that when you're working say with the commission um, of a documentary and say you're working with CBC and, and that kind of thing. And similarly with the podcasting world, um, there's that, that, that kind of professionalism that people use. So there's um, basically what's called a unit and allows and flats. And in the unit column, they'll often see the days and the weeks and other like specific kind of units that show each quantity is determined. And allow in the column means an estimate. And so you allow like quote unquote, um, say $1,000 for office expenses for the entire production um, and the best to av avoid these allows whenever possible because they can be vague and ambiguous and open for debate. And instead it's better to offer um, a straight up uh, you know, $100 um, uh, per month, you know, office supplies, is, that's your maximum for your budget and it'd be much more clear and, and easier to defend. Um, and then the flat fee means the contractual amount that you can't change. So if you have a contract, say, with a music composer um, to compose and produce and deliver the score, um, say that will be for $35,000 flat. Um, and honestly, like in a lot of documentary um, podcasts, um, the 25,000 to 35,000 is the range of what um, music composers and music designers and music engineers and, you know, high production value, which they're totally worth um, uh, cost. Um, and basically the, that is fixed and will not change. Um, unless, of course, you, you change other constraints stipulated in that contract, like switching from in this case, like a, a string quartet to a full orchestra. Depends on the different kind of needs for your team. Anyways, your empty lines, you'll notice that the sample budget includes lines where there's no money being spent. And normally that's hidden, but they will include there to become more, make the temple template more useful. And basically, for example, the project development, when you're first working on your documentary podcast, you wanna have the, the, the chart of accounts, these numbers, Sorry, um, I think that's my internet. I'm gonna turn it off. Um, basically the staff for the development phase, the producers and the directors and staff costs for the development phase. And then the next line, um, the 1,100 line on the chart of accounts um, refers to research. So you could be looking at books and videos, meetings and other research expenses. Um, and then the next one could be research travel. Um, for a lot of uh, producers, they'll put in the budget for people to you know, go on different trips and different places that they can do the recordings. Um, and anyways, and then there's the 1,300 line, which includes the production and the post-production um, fundraising. So basically, 
creating like say a trailer and in the filmmaking world that's helpful and in the podcasting documentary world it can be helpful too to have a teaser to have a, a sizzle reel um, of the audio so that people can who are investing in it and who are part of the fundraising um, can help with the um, understanding of where you're going creatively with it so the sample budget covers say like you know eight days of recording and then you know say two weeks of editing depending on the project that could be more complex so basically like the next line is fundraising costs and materials. This is when you you must, um, this is most important, I can't stress it enough for people who are producing uh, documentary audio content um, to make sure that they put in their budget, the cost of their materials of their grant writing. Um, and basically uh, the fundraising um, the grant writing and the drafting of the budgets and the market recognition uh, fees and promotional materials. Um, these costs will vary uh, based on how much research and revision is required and how much um, the team can do in-house. And basically there's like the fundraising travel, people will travel to markets and they'll meet with vendors. And so they'll put that in the budget as well for project development phase. That's what it's called the development phase. So in regards to producing staff, like this is really important for people to um, research and to call people and to ask what their um, estimates would be for their fees. There's directors, producers, and writers, what they call above the line fee in the filmmaking world. So these fees will vary widely and they'll be reasonable for each person's um, experience level, production, locale, and their overall budget level. So the director, the producer, the writer, they'll plan to spend like say two years full time on this project. So that fee could be easily higher and reach 10% of this budget. In the case the producer is budgeted slightly less than the director and producer based on assumptions that they will director and producer will own the project and will be working long before and long after this two-year project period. And if this was say like a commissioned um, documentary uh, project with say a, a director working for hire this balance might, will, might be reversed. So basically union projects work on this um, uh, in order to comply with their guild agreements. So that's where a lot of this um, is really important. Um, and then the production fee, which is um, basically a line that everyone needs to, to have um, very important, is that this is where the funders, your investors, uh, say like your family, your friends, like different like people, business people, um, will they require the rental of all the producer owned equipment to be represented as a single production fee. And then we're going to move on to rights, music, and talent. So basically story and other rights, the project is based on, say, a book or an article or song, copyrighted material, and intellectual property. You're going to have to pay for those rights to make that documentary based on that material. And basically, that's called the story rights. And then the next line is archival photographs and footage in the documentary video world. Um, that would include the cost of researching licensing video material, and in this case would be audio material, with the exception of um, the archival researcher listed under staff. Um, anyways, and so basically, the archives, they could be charging a 30 second minimum, no matter the length of this clip that you might use, and you might need to budget for more seconds if they're going to be using that. Anyways, and then the next line would be talent. So that could be um, your narrator for your documentary audio podcast. If you're planning to do reenactment or you're re hiring a narrator, you'll be listing the talent there. And it could be based on union rates um, uh, for actor guilds. And rates vary considerably, and they're subject to the union and those guild agreements. So you'll need to read and need to contact them and ask them questions. And you'll be conscious about the the um, where you're going to be doing that, like different specific rules about your recordings, and where and when and with who and all of that. You'll be negotiating. So the next line in the budget will be the music. And in this sample, nearly all the music is composed. I have to get my dog one sec. He's making a lot of noise. Sorry. Come here. Come here. Come here. I'm back. Dogs. Pay no attention to the dog behind the curtain. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like I'm in the Wizard of Oz. Okay, so the music, um, basically the in the sample that I'll provide in a second, um, the music is composed and delivered and um, by the composer and their songs are licensed. Basically, um, you know, these, the rates that you negotiate and projects can be more extensive with licensing needs requiring, say, a music supervisor, or production, post-production supervisor, um, or they could be a lot less expensive um, if you just do it yourself. With much of the time as producers, we end up wearing many hats and a lot of these things get um, uh, washed away to 
uh, one person doing it, even though it looks like many people are doing it. It's all very interesting. But anyways, in an ideal world, um, in a high production value budget, we would include the staff in our budget. And it's really important, I think, for everyone to, to think about that. So the production staff um, line um, item would re re refer to the composition of the crew and their rates can vary considerably. So this crew refers to, um, you know, the people who are doing the audio recording. Um, if, you know, I'm the, the producer and I'm working with a, a director um, we have these conversations about um, our in, in the independent documentary world, the, the video crew, um, but oftentimes the sound recordist in a documentary audio podcast um, is our crew. And so often this budget will reveal to our funders, stop it, <laughs> talk, their funders exactly how you're planning to make this uh, audio. And anyways, keeping in mind that while these crew rates are somewhat negotiable, it's best to prioritize um, parity amongst the different crew members. Anyways, and so the next line um, is really, really important to me because the editors, um, they're the ones that in documentary independent world need to be put and prioritized in the budget because they're the ones who are going to spend a lot of time in the edit room. And they're the ones that are the talented uh, editor that, that will be just the single most important line item in this entire budget. Any kind of films, any kind of podcasts, any kind of documentaries at all, they usually have a lot of assistant editors. They're working simultaneously with the archives, with the music, with the sound effects, and working on low budget projects. It's often that the director knows the material best and they may perform some of the um, assistant functions in the editing post production. Um, but it's important to pay them as well for that um, and not just have it as part of their, their fee. So in both staff sections, the last item in personal taxes, there are costs that an employer um, must pay in addition to the employee salary and include the social security, um, you know, different like Medicare and like federal or state unemployment insurance, and of course, workers' compensation, union and payroll service fees, the payroll service, um, this kind of stuff. There's like all these software that can help with that. So anyways, and then basically um, producers have to avoid uh, having your personal taxes. And so you want to make sure that you classify the crew as independent contractor in your budget. And there's a, you have to contact your own local tax office for that kind of thing to get more information about HR. Anyway, so moving on to production expenses. Um, for me, the really important part of a, a documentary audio or a documentary video um, budget is uh, factoring in your equipment, your camera, your sound, your lighting, your grip, your um, facilities, your services required to shoot in the documentary, in this case, you know, um, the audio. Uh, so basically the equipment rentals, um, we often get them because of um, we have like a teams that we work with that already own their equipment, but you can get them from a studio, you can get them from say, you're a member of uh, an organization like a nonprofit um, where you can get your equipment rentals. You know, I, I remember, at the media lab at the art space, uh, renting their equipment a lot of the time here in Peterborough. And so for long-term projects, this can be tricky in the budget because they can sometimes exceed the cost of the purchasing equipment. And I've totally run into that. And that's why we ended up buying um, uh, the equipment ourselves and creating our own production company and registering with a number and you know going into business. And in these cases, the production will choose to buy equipment and then resell it at the end of production. Many people have done that in the, in the documentary world. Anyways, and then the other option is the production may rent the gear um, from say the rental house. Anyways, many funders have these policies where rentals cannot exceed more than 50% of the purchase price. So it's really important to consider that when you're making your documentary podcast and producing. And it's really important to remember that there's different kinds of scenarios that you want to um, be really clear and upfront with your funders um, because they want to be able to um, know that like you're going to be able to have your equipment usually or make your you say your your laptop and your um, recording um, equipment yourself anyways and then your next line will be your in a lot of times there's been a lab like you know for film and development but in this case that's not really relevant but you have to think about in your budget um, hard drives for making a documentary audio podcast so that's really important to make sure you prioritize that on your budget because I've forgotten that before and then I've needed to like hard drives for um, and it's really important that you remember that down so make a note of that um, and that goes under production um, film and lab under that line um, and then the next one is the uh, say uh, local expenses, which means basically like, you know, going out and getting crew meals and like different kinds of coffee and things like that. And you put that in the budget because oftentimes you want to feed your crew and you want to make sure that they have their, their coffee. And so this is an example um, that I had put down uh, as expected 
timeline um, and then you I was making a grant and this is one of the examples for it so you have like your research and you write for four weeks um, that's like your pre-production and then you have like your production which could be like just one day um, and then you say you put in factor for your post-production um, for your edit of that sound say for like five weeks and then you basically like um, uh, think about how you're going to you know, create that budget with your um, deposit that you're going to have reserved for getting that crew together. And then you're going to have um, basically your principal production will start and you need to have at least a certain amount of it um, figured out by your, your deadlines. And you're thinking about your cost of editing, you're thinking about your sound mix, your sound design, your sound mastering, your music composition, your music rights, graphic design, you know, producer fees, production studios, archives, all your, your casting crew. So basically, um, uh, your post-production, uh, this is like the, the one that I really want to emphasize because basically as any problems arise during um, production, you'll want to, the people will suggest that you could fix it in post, but really it's really expensive. And so you want to be able to uh, make sure that you have like a lot of time to be able to edit because it can't afford to carry too much baggage. Um, of you got to do lots of research and make sure you select a really good editor and like online facility and like a sound designer and like talk about all those things um, beforehand and to have those conversations um, so that you can uh, make sure that you cover all of your your costs and time save time um, and insurance of course is really important it, there's something called in the video documentary world errors and omissions insurance which is transferable over to the documentary audio um, uh, landscape for podcasts and it's basically um, uh, helpful for commercial distribution because um, it, it actually saves you from getting sued in case there's any risk of you um, uh, taking anything that you weren't supposed to and anybody getting offended by what you're recording and editing so that's really important for people in the entertainment industry is to consider general liability the insurance with errors and emissions so it's important to put that in the budget and the, my most important favorite like line in a, in a documentary budget is publicity promotion and website and festivals um, i'm a person who does a lot of these things myself um, i wear many hats um, and it always seems like a lot of the budget gets put into the pre-production and into the production and into the post-production and there's not enough money left over but i think it's really important that people prioritize in the early conversations with their cast and crew um, that they make sure that they put in a sizable amount equivalent into the other three sections uh, for getting listenership, getting an audience. Um, and this is the part where you get into film festivals. This is the part where you might do a social impact crowdfunding campaign. This is when you, you're, you're actually thinking about, say, different kinds of uh, funding bodies like broadcasters that want to be able to show um, your work. And then there's the final items. So in a, a good budget, in the best budget um, for documentary, you want to have the contingency. So that's because the production's unpredictable. That's usually a 10, um, 5 to 10 buffer range. And th this protects you from the unexpected, which in numerous times this has come in handy at the end of the day because all of a sudden I have this like hidden money that I budgeted for, which has been such a surprise and so helpful to get to the race line, to get to done. So anyways, um, a lot of times funders won't allow it, but I think it's extremely important. I learned about it in documentary film school, how incredible um, uh, helpful it is. So anyways, you want to not cut that and you want to make sure that you adjust these line items throughout this living document um, for the inevitable surprises that come. And basically, if you work with a fiscal sponsor fee, there's the admin fee to pay for the nonprofit organization to help receive those grants and charitable donations. And that, like I said, with Media Arts Peterborough, we're able to work with the, um, the organization of Arts Space Media Lab, and we're able to help uh, us, you know, with our Ontario Arts Council uh, funds and our charitable donations that we got from different philanthropists in, in Peterborough at the time with our What Is Art um, documentary podcast. And so these are the kinds of things that are really important to prioritize in your, your budget. So I'm going to stop there because I think it's been 20 minutes and I'm going to have Q&A and ask me questions and then I'm going to move on with the next uh, chunk if we have time. Awesome. Thanks, Angel. It, it was uh, about 40 minutes actually, but that, that was a great, um, that was a, 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 an amazing uh, bit of information that you had there. For folks who have questions, you can either, uh, either uh, use the raise hand button in, in Zoom and I will enable talking for you. Um, once I've enabled talking, you'll have to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, so Nick, I've just enabled uh, talking for you. Rick, you still have talking permitted and uh, great. Oh. Uh, 
Nick, your microphone is uh, okay. um, we can hear you kind of poorly, but um try again. I'm doing it through the cell phone. Oh yeah. Okay. I will there we go, we can hear slowly. you. Um is this form of budget being recommended before you even first episode? I understand that hey, um, one needs to develop an audience, but I, um, or is this, um, yeah, needs to grow an audience um, before getting funded? Um, or has, you know, yeah, that's my question, I guess. Which one comes first? Jake and getting funded or building the audience first? I, I, I actually um, have done the first uh, with building the audience first. So basically with the uh, Say What Is Art documentary podcast that um, I'm the host of and producer of, uh, we just started um, uh, going out first to the farmer's market with our um, uh, Zoom like mic, um, our H4 Zoom mic, and we just started interviewing people. What is art? And once we started creating that content and started uploading it, we barely edited it. Um, then we started having more people contacting us um, to want to answer the question, what is art? And it was kind of like a guerrilla DIY, like media activism and media art experiment, you know, with like a, a, a nonprofit, very small little crew, just like three of us, a sound recordist. Um, in that case, we had like the camera, which was collecting the audio and before um, we we went into the place where we were video editing because that's so expensive we had to apply for more money and budget for that so we just went right for the audio and just started to like share it with people on social media so that created the momentum created the audience created like a, a weekly show on Trent Radio for example and so once we got doing that we were able to get more people investing in wanting to create more content uh, for the show, for for the podcast, because ultimately you know, uploading it online and creating more of the um, uh, the video came later with the but this this living document of the budget ultimately um, creates the the content. It, it, it's like all connected. I'm not sure if I answered the question properly, but that's it's a tough call of the chicken and the egg because like you could try to do all this research and brainstorm with all this budget and then like it all changes in the field it changes when you start like doing like the unpredictable surprises of all the changing needs and and schedules and um you have to have a, a, a constant communication with your key crew and your key cast um that you're working with and i i'm always uh having to to do that that balancing act <laughs> so yeah and is there another another question um, that uh, is out there that I can also answer as well before I move on. Did that answer the question well? Yeah, you did. Okay. <laughs> Um, but your your called your podcast is called the Documentary Podcast. Yeah, it's actually called the What Is Art um, podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, I, I got confused with the other podcast that just canceled about a year ago, the Documentary Life Podcast. Oh, um, I know that one. I've listened to that yeah, before yeah, on yeah, iTunes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. No, you're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Angel, I was wondering if you, like, how do you think of the different phases of a, of a production? Like, and is it conceivable that like, you'd have more than like a pre-production, production and post-production phase? Like, yeah. how does that work? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. That's actually a brilliant question. Um, personally, I feel like there's more, instead of like the five um, phases, it's more of like the, you know, double that. Um, because like, for me in, pre-production that's divided up into a couple of different phases because when you first started having those meetings and you start first started having those uh conversations about how you're going to create the script and how you're going to create the treatment and the proposal and how you're going to um have the 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 people uh say your your director your producer um your audio recordist envision the sound landscape and envision in my case with video the 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 visual storytelling devices and how we're going to get the story rights, how we're going to get like the audio um, uh, mixer and like how, who we're going to work with, you know, so that's like a, um, broken up into different kinds of phases in the, in like what they call pre-production, but it's like pre-pre-production because it's before you even apply for any grants, it's before you even doing any like Indiegogo crowdfunding and before you even like have like your solid production um, schedule 
Um, so yeah, like you're, you're doing a lot of uh, office work and there's like a lot, you get your memberships to you know, different kinds of things like say Peter Rowan, dependent podcasting and you're kind of getting in this momentum. And then when you go into the field and you go into production, officially what they call in the, in the, in the documentary video world, principal um, uh, photography, that's like your first day of shooting, like say on your camera. And in this case would be with your, your audio, with your Zoom. Um, and with your sound recorders, it could just be yourself with your headphones. But basically, that could just be like a day, but maybe it's longer, maybe it's a few days. And so that like has different kinds of phases in there because it depends um, you know, if you're going to different locations. If you're traveling, say like with your car and you're going to like the farmers market, you have like, you know, different kinds of um uh you know, needs that you have to put in your living budget documentary um, budget um, of how to like, you know, imagine, oh, okay, so these, this is how I'm fulfilling my script and the beats of the story. And this is how I'm going to edit it. So you're thinking ahead of like um, into the next phase of like your post-production phase. And so when you're in that phase, that starts getting broken up between the meetings with your editors, your assistant editors, your, your archival team. And then it gets broken up within the, the community of people that you're, um, uh, you know, talking to about the, the audio script and, and what you're, you say you're and investors would like and so then that's broken down um, further into phases and then the phase that I think really needs to be fleshed down it's not just like post um, it's not just marketing phase for me I call it the the digital distribution phase because that's where they have the, um, uh, the six weeks you know minimum in my opinion and that's the best to have really important I can't stress enough to people that to have the conversation with your digital distribution coordinator at the beginning of your project to have that meeting and to budget that um, because that's how you're going to be able to find the opportunity to send your documentary podcast to festivals and to have a, a put up on iTunes and put up with say the Peter Rowan Independent Podcasting Association and have it properly marketed so that you have an audience for listenership on a regular basis and that ideally is what you can I mean reality is different I, um, you know there's so many different deadlines and distractions and things in our world but if you create the ideal um, and do the research and do the budget and do the schedule and you have a team of accountability and you're working with other people and trying to create that momentum um, as a say a journalist or as a documentarian then you're, you're more likely to to keep going and keep generating these phases and keep um, uh, succeeding and having a positive and successful budget living document yeah, that okay. makes a lot of sense. Okay. I'll just remind folks that um, if you want to ask a question, you can either do so in the chat or use the raise hand button um, and I will enable talking for you. Um, okay. But seeing no one else raising their hand, uh, do you want to carry on? Yep. So post-production sound for a documentary um, podcast and audio storytelling. Because audio post is the last step in the process before mastering, a lot of producers in the documentary world will give it a little bit less respect. And that's only because they have less money. And maybe they've um, you know, run out of this money. So in this case, it deserves full attention and it's extremely important to prioritize this fair share of the budget because the audio and the soundtrack will actually ruin your project if it's not done in a professional way. And so for me, like um, I've had to really make sure that that is considered um, uh, to get my sound design team and sound mix team prioritized and getting paid, whether it be through you know pitching and um, sales pitch. Um, this is incredibly important thing to put into your, your living document of your budget um, for documentary podcasting. So conversely, if an um, uh, elevate your storytelling to another level. Anyways, so there's two sides to this coin. There's the creative side and there's the technical side. On the creative side, you can consult with your sound designer, your supervising sound editor early on in your pre-production phase, and you can get their ideas about how the sound will help tell the story. You, why? Because it may change the way that you record certain audio scenes. On the technical side, make sure there's a conversation between the editor and the sound editor about how the editor should prepare the dialogue and other sound elements during um, the picture edit, and in this case, the audio edit. Um, obviously, there's little talk should occur before the audio sound begins. Good communication at this stage will save you time and money during the audio post. I'm literally getting this out of my film and video book, by the way. Um, I literally like I'm so inspired by right now so audio posts for film um, basically this is of course transferable to, to audio documentary um, on a large document 
production, they'll be supervising the sound editor to ride um, uh, all of the herd of the crew in the post um, uh, sound editing and artist elements. On the small project, there might be only one sound editor and the project is ready for the audio post. There's lots of sounds that you want to prepare, the music and the dialogue and what's called automated dialogue replacement, ADR, they refer to it. And that's basically when you do the Zoom calls and the, the different audio, say for actors, like with fiction, um, that's what they call the ADR. And then Foley refers to sound effects um, and also narration. Let's take um, each item. So the sound editor, the supervising sound editor, aka the sound designer, works with the director and other team members to design um, the overall creative and technical approach to the sound of the project. And the process begins in pre-production and they work with the picture editor, in this case, the sound editor. The sound editor will do much of the actual editing and they'll lay it out and placing effects in the proper places and prepare for the mix. Supervising sound editors range from $300 to $700 per 10 days, hour days. Um, an assistant sound editor uh, will work on laying on the tracks and prepare for the sound designer. And the assistant sound editor, the rates will vary from $1,200 to $1,500 per week. So a dialogue editor will assemble um, the tracks and synchronize and edit and clean up and smooth out all of the dialogue. And basically we'll use the production tracks um, and any of them that are unusable, we replace them with an alternative production track recorded on set with the automated dialogue replacement. So basically, um, in the world of fiction and, and in documentary um, video, they'll often have actors that are doing reenactments. And in this case, you know, podcasting documentary, they'll have audio um, uh, yeah, dialogue of the actors performing in the sound studio, and they'll re-record their lines professionally um, inside the studio. And then the dialogue editor will need to fill in the tracks and there'll be like a usually a 30 second recording of the sound of the actual place. This is really important to have that because that's actually where they have the, the crew um, and the equipment, everything will be set up and the room tone. Um, that's the dialogue editor's lifeblood. A good sound mixer on set will always make sure they have the 30 second room tone because that's how you're going to edit um, inside your documentary podcast um, for the, 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 whole, um, the whole project. You'll have your sound effects and um, you'll have your room tone and you'll be mixing that with your narration and be mixing that with your um, beginning um, uh, intro and then your outro at the end. So rates for, for them usually professionally, like say in like Toronto, like in the in the documentary audio landscape would be ranging from 1,500 to 2,500 per week. So what they call um, spotting refers to the music and the effects. So basically the supervising sound editor, the music editor, the composer, the director, the producer, they'll watch the, the finished picture edit, in this case, the audio edit, they'll listen to the audio edit. And basically when they're listening to this, they'll call it the spotting session. They all talk about where the music should be, what kinds of feelings that it should invoke. The composer will write the music and play it for the director and the producer and editor in these listening sessions. Once the creative aspects of the score are approved, it's ready to be recorded on a music scoring stage. The director and the supervising editor will have a long session and they'll spot for sound um, effects and what they should and what they shouldn't be like, what emotions are intended according to the story, um, according to the treatment of the proposal, which was made in the pre-production stage. And so they'll create the, the what they call an aural dimension which is basically like a, the landscape um, of your, your audio documentary podcast to be able to enhance the story beats and uh, basically according to like the hero journey and the arc beats. Anyways, after they do this, um, they put in the effects and then they create from the effects library. You can get it from the open source or from your, um, in your budget. Um, uh, you can have the engineer have their own um, uh, effect sessions and then they're able to afford say real musicians which would be wonderful to put that in the budget um and basically uh you have like you know, skip to um yeah i'll just do that one last one and then the music is underway it's time to consider how you're going to um in your spotting session and your audio post house confirm that your dialogue um will be replaced and that edr editor prepares all of your cue sheets for the mixer and then they'll project um, the audio and you'll be able to listen to it um, and have it polished. So anyways, basically the um, film and video budget, which is this book, which is the one that I've used for um, this whole presentation, 
I highly recommend everybody getting a copy, but for producers, I highly recommend that in the documentary world, you get a membership for Peterborough Independent Podcasting Association, and you take all of the um, uh, wonderful meetings um, with Aisha, and you make sure that you keep creating content. And the more you create content, the better you will be at creating a budget. And the more that you get to be um, a documentary audio storyteller, then you get to keep learning and keep sharing. And what I've done is become a member of Documentary Organization of Canada um, remote branch um, here in Peterborough for the, the, the Toronto chapter. And then also like the women in film, I have a dual membership between Vancouver and Toronto and remote. So I benefit from all of the Zoom and the webinars online. Plus I go to the Sundance um, Documentary Doc Institute, um, which is online for their collab. And that's where I get a lot of my training from. Um, as well as things like, you know, uh, lynda.com through my LinkedIn account, which I highly recommend everybody doing for documentary podcasting. And are we out of time now? No, we actually have an extra half hour. So Great. These are the questions that I had brainstormed. And so we can check in with the people and then we can, um, uh, the questions that I had brought up, and then we can go further and talk about how we can flesh these things out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for the presentation, Angel. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, the recording is going to go up on YouTube, but we've got Perfect. another half hour for the folks who are here in session to um, talk about the projects if they want to ask questions. Beauty. <laughs>